Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in today's presentation we're going to be looking at the Precambrian and its life history. So I'm sure you'll understand the Precambrian is obviously a very large topic, so we're going to split it into two presentations. The first presentation is going to focus on the Hadean and the Archean, and the second presentation is going to focus on the Proterozoic. Okay, let's get going. So by now I'm sure you've spotted the geologic timescale is essentially divided into two chunks. The first chunk is the Precambrian and that goes from the creation of the Earth about 4.5 billion years ago through till about 0.5 billion years ago. The other chunk is the Phanerozoic and that goes from about 0.5 billion years ago through to the present day. Now, the dividing boundary between these two chunks, essentially, which is the Cambrian Proterozoic boundary, which, sit, which sits at about 541 to 542 million years ago, is based on the first appearance of macrofossils with hard shells and skeletons. So, this means that after 541 to 542 million years ago, rocks which are forming have the possibility of containing macro fossils that we can see quite easily and because they have these hard shells and hard skeletons the chances of them fossilizing successfully are a lot higher. Now this makes it very easy to split up the uh, the Phanerozoic portion of the geologic time scale because we have all these fossils and we can use them to define the boundaries between different periods, eras, eons, ages, epochs etc. Now when early geologists started going out into the field and looking at these rocks, they, you know, they would find the rocks, they could find the rocks that had the fossils in them relatively easily, and we've already discussed those fossils are quite useful because they help us to date rocks and they also help us to correlate rocks over quite large distances. However, these early geologists suddenly realised that there was a bit of a problem. So they had all these rocks that contained fossils, but they also had a whole pile of rocks which did not. Now, when they looked at these rocks and, and put them in the relative order in which they formed, they very quickly came to the realisation that these rocks were the oldest rocks in the sequence and that they were older than the Cambrian. And so this meant that early geologists essentially said, right, well, we don't have fossils in these rocks, therefore it's difficult to split these rocks up into individual units using the fossils. So what we're going to do is we're just going to lump all of these fossil-free rocks together and we're going to call them the Precambrian. Now, obviously, they had no idea what amount of time this Precambrian actually represented. So the situation is, is that the Earth is about 4.56 billion years old. And life itself, didn't, life in the form of macro fossils, didn't appear until about 542, 541 million years ago. And so this means that there's approximately 4 billion years of geologic time during which rock was forming, but it didn't contain macro fossils. That's about 88% of the geologic record on Earth. So this is obviously quite problematic. So we have this huge chunk of rock, which is very difficult to split up because number one, it doesn't contain macro fossils. It does contain micro fossils but they're very, very rare and very difficult to find, so unfortunately not really that helpful in the grand scale of things. But the other problem is that these old rocks have undergone metamorphism and deformation in a lot of cases, and this means that the original rock itself has either been very badly deformed or completely changed into a new rock. So we don't really have much of an idea of what that rock looked like in the, looked like in the first place, and therefore that also makes it difficult to split up this chunk of, you know, this, this Precambrian chunk of rocks based on things like changes in rock chemistry. So how do we get round this problem? Well, this pie chart is just going to quickly show you the breakdown of the geologic timescale so you can kind of you know see, graphically speaking, exactly how things work out. So obviously here we have the Phanerozoic going from the Cambrian all the way through to the Holocene, and you'll notice that when it really comes down to it, it's actually quite a small chunk of geologic time. The vast majority is made up of the Proterozoic, the Hadean, and the Archean. And you'll notice it comes to about 88% of all geologic time. So how do we split up this huge chunk of rocks that doesn't have any fossils in it? Well, up until 1982, we didn't really try to. We just simply called it all the Precambrian and we were pretty much done with it. Now, as you've already discussed, though, this is obviously a very long time period. Lots of rocks were deposited. So what we really want to do is we really do want to split it up into chunks so that we can work with it a little bit more easily. 
And so in 1982, the Precambrian was split into three eons. So we have the Hadean, which goes from the Earth's creation about 4.56 billion years ago through to 4 billion years. We have the Archean, 4 billion years to 2.5 billion years. And we have the Proterozoic, 2.5 billion years to 0.5 billion years. And you can see them here. Now, what you'll notice is, is that on the whole, these are quite nice round numbers. So Earth uh, formed here. Then 400, 4 million years ago, there's the Hadean Archean boundary. 2.5 billion years ago, there's the Archean Proterozoic boundary. And of course, the Proterozoic Cambrian boundary is set by the first appearance of Shelley life at about 541 to 542 million years ago. So if you look at this geologic time scale, you'll notice that essentially these numbers are pretty much arbitrary. They've just been picked. So as there's a lack of dating evidence that occurs on a large global, large or global scale, selecting events that can represent a change in the period have proven difficult. So, you know, what you really want is you want to see some kind of change across a, uh, a bedding plane. So you want to see a change in the fossils or maybe some kind of change in chemistry in the, in the rocks would be helpful as well. You could use that as a boundary. But the problem is, as we've discussed, these are, you know, these Precambrian rocks tend to have had quite a long, hard life and they don't contain fossils. So it's very difficult to find something which you can say right we can use this as a boundary so when it comes down to it the Archean the Proterozoic are split into 1.5 and 2 billion year chunks so we need, as I said we need to remember these periods are arbitrary and there's actually relatively little evidence to anchor these boundaries so an attempt was made in 2012 to actually come up with anchored boundaries using the latest uh, geologic research to try and split the Precambrian up um, more accurately. Now, at present, these boundaries haven't been accepted yet, so they're not in the geologic timescale, but people are working on trying to you know, make the change happen. Now, if we actually look, we can see just how arbitrary these boundaries are when it comes to the Precambrian. So if we look at the Archean, you'll notice that these boundaries are split into 400 million year chunks, pretty much. When we come on to the Proterozoic, you'll notice that these chunks are about 200 million years each. So when it really comes down to it, they've just said, right, we're going to split this up into these you know, relatively even sized portions. And that's going to allow us to, just, you know, to break up the Precambrian. But these boundaries aren't really solid, so they aren't really anchored to anything. So we need to remember that during the Precambrian, things were rather different. So for a while, we didn't actually have a complete crust. We also have a situation that the Earth's interior was hotter, so this means plate tectonics is going to be happening a lot faster. We have the oceans initially not being present and then forming after about 4.4 billion years. So that, you know, around 4.4 billion years ago, we start seeing the first indications of possible liquid water on the surface of the Earth. The Earth's atmosphere will, number one, appear. But the initial atmosphere will be quite carbon dioxide rich, and then over time we'll see the amount of carbon dioxide dropping and the amount of oxygen increasing. Now, once we start to have free oxygen in the atmosphere, we'll start to see the appearance of things like an ozone layer. And life didn't actually appear until about 3.5 billion years ago. So there's lots of periods during the Precambrian where essentially, you know, if we were to land on it in our you know, time machine, we would think this is a pretty alien looking place. But as we go through the Precambrian, it's going to become more like today. So it's going to start off very, very different. But over the pre, you know, as we move from the Hadean into the Archean and then eventually into the Proterozoic, we're going to see the Earth is going to become a little bit more familiar. OK, so let's start with the Hadean. So the Hadean encompasses a period of approximately 600 million years between the formation of the Earth and the start of the Archean. So that's four billion years ago. Although the 4 billion year boundary is arbitrary, it does happen to coincide with a couple of key events. So around 4 billion years ago, that's kind of the period in which we start to see the appearance of widespread stable crust. Okay, so remember, during the Hadean, things are going to be very, very chaotic. The Earth's interior is going to be very, very hot, and this means plate tectonics is going to be operating very, very quickly. Also, because the Earth's interior is going to be very, very hot, well, that means the, uh, you know, the mantle is going to be very, very buoyant. It's going to want to rise. And so that means if you're trying to subduct something down into the mantle, well, that's going to be very, very difficult because the mantle is going to be pushing back. 
And so this means that from a plate tectonic point of view, the early Earth would have been a very, very messy place. And this would have led to lots of you know, pieces of crust that formed essentially being unstable and being destroyed. So around 4 billion years ago, we start to see the first appearance of widespread stable crust. Now, we classify this as stable crust because it's managed to exist all the way through to the present day. And therefore, by, its very, by that very nature, it must be stable. The other thing that we see around the Hadean Archean boundary is something called the Late Heavy Bombardment, which is sometimes abbreviated to the LHB. So the Late Heavy Bombardment represents the Earth's final period of accretion, so that's its growth, and it occurred between about 3.8 and 4.1 billion years ago. So the Earth itself formed by the process of accretion, which is lots and lots of particles sticking themselves together over periods of time and essentially forming a mass which gets larger and larger and larger as more material is added. And that material can range in diameter all the way from tiny, tiny, tiny little dust particles all the way through to, planet, all the way through to planets about the size of Mars. And so all that stuff will combine together and it will form the Earth. So the late heavy bombardment represents the very final stage of this growth. So between about 3.8 and 4.1 billion years ago, what happened was is disturbances in the solar system ended up throwing meteorites and comets into the inner portion of the solar system in huge numbers. So this period during which we have all these comets and meteorites hurtling into the inner solar system created a substantial portion of the craters visible on the moon. So if we extrapolate from the number of craters we see on the moon and the size of the moon, and if we take that and apply it to the Earth, it would have meant that the Earth during the late heavy bombardment would have been hit about 22,000 times. Now, that's a lot of hits. Okay, and think about it. One hit was enough to destroy the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous. So imagine 22,000 of them. So that's you know quite a lot of impacts happening over from a ge happening from a geologic point of view over quite a short period. So that's obviously going to be a lot of new mass being added to the Earth very very quickly. So this bombardment is important as it helps us to add more sidrophile elements to the mantle and the crust. So if you remember, sidrophile means iron loving. And so when the Earth first formed, lots of these sigrophile elements went with the iron-nickel alloy that went to form the Earth's core. This meant that they got stripped out of, the, man of the, uh, the magma that went to form the mantle and the crust, and so the mantle and the crust are actually quite sigrophile element poor. Now, most of the elements, most of the sigrophile elements that we do have in the upper mantle and the crust were probably added during this late heavy bombardment. So all these meteorites and comets that came flying in and, you know, smashed into the Earth, they will have helped to have seeded the upper layers of the Earth, so the upper mantle and the crust, with, you know, additional sigrophile elements. So another reason why the late heavy bombardment is important is because some modelling has suggested that a significant amount of water may well have been added to the Earth during this period. So one of the things that we think happened was a lot of these impacts would actually not have been meteorites, which are rocky. We think a lot of them would have actually been comets, which are made mostly of ice. And so a lot of this ice consists of uh, water ice. There's also carbon dioxide ice, methane ice, ammonia ice, etc. But the one we're most interested in is the water ice. And so all of this water ice being added to the Earth will also have helped to increase the Earth's water budget. And therefore that will have helped in the formation of the oceans. So... Why did this late heavy bombardment happen? Well, we're not actually 100% sure. There's quite a few reasons why, you know, that could have possibly caused it. So possibly the, the most, most reasonable one was that Neptune and Uranus migrated outwards. So we actually think that Uranus and Neptune may well have actually formed in between Jupiter and Saturn and then migrated outwards towards their current position. And so what's going to happen is as they move outwards in you know further from the sun to deeper into the solar system they're going their gravity is going to start disturbing a group of um comets essentially which sit in something called the uh Kuiper belt. So all of these comets are going to suddenly find themselves being disturbed by the gravity from Uranus and Neptune and that's going to essentially cause them to fall out of their nice stable orbits and obviously when that happens gravity is going to kick in 
obviously the sun is quite you know, got quite a strong gravitational pull and it's going to start attracting this material towards the center of the solar system so this you know these comets are going to come hurtling in towards the inner solar system which is where earth is located so one of the reasons the light heavy bombardment could have occurred is because of uranus and neptune migrating there's the possibility that maybe Jupiter also migrated inwards a little bit, and this could have uh, disturbed the asteroid belt. There's also the possibility that Mars could actually have formed outside the asteroid belt and migrated through it to its present day. This would have also disturbed the asteroid belt and caused asteroids to have been thrown into the inner solar system. There's also the possibility that there may have been an unknown fifth terrestrial planet which was actually thrown out of the inner solar system and as it was leaving that could have disturbed the asteroid belt again which could have led to uh, asteroids being thrown into the inner solar system. And there's also the possibility that you could have some kind of orbital resonance uh, occurring between Jupiter and Saturn. So when they start you know, aligning with each other, the, the gravitational uh, disturbance produced by this alignment could be enough to disturb the orbits of these comets and asteroids in the solar system. And that would lead them to being you know, that would lead them to be thrown into the inner solar system. Or maybe the most obvious, you know, the straightforward answer is possibly that the uh, late heavy bombardment is just due to Uranus and Neptune actually forming in the first place. And obviously their appearance and their gravity will once again disturb the comet-rich uh, Kuiper belt and lead to, the for lead to our comets being thrown into the inner solar system. So there's quite a few reasons why this late heavy bombardment could have happened, but it's actually quite important because it adds sigephile elements, it adds water, but it also does quite a lot of damage to the Earth's crust. So there's debate about whether the heat produced by this late heavy bombardment could have been high enough to fully or partially melt the Earth's crust. Now, it had been assumed that the Earth's surface was molten until about 3.8 billion years ago. However, that didn't really work because when we did modeling of a, you know, a magma ocean the size of the Earth and we started to let it cool down, it became very quickly that it should have actually started to form a crispy crust pretty fast. However, we had absolutely no evidence of this crust before 3.8 billion years. So the oldest crustal rocks we had were 3.8 billion years ago. We had no evidence for a crust before that. However, Analysis of sandstones from the Jack Hills area of Australia revealed zircons which ranged in age from about 4 billion years to 4.4 billion years old. Now, these zircons uh, are most likely of uh, continental crust origin. So they're probably from felsic igneous rocks, which were essentially intruded into the crust. And then obviously these rocks were exposed, they were weathered, and the zircons that were in them were mixed in with the sandstone. So this tells us that around 4.4 billion years ago, we have to have had a crust into which these granites could have intruded. So that would mean about 4.4 billion years ago, we must have had this, we probably had some form of solid crust. However, this then brings about the question of, well, hold on a minute, if we think we had it, where is it? You know, there should be pieces of it somewhere and well the reason we think we might not be able to find much of it is simply because the late heavy bombardment may well have destroyed a very substantial portion of it so think about it 22,000 impacts happening over 300 million years that's a lot so that's a lot of energy that's being put onto the surface of the earth very very quickly it's going to cause a lot of energy to be imparted into the earth that's going to cause the temperature of the earth to increase and so it wouldn't be unthinkable for the impacts and the heating produced by those impacts to destroy a very significant chunk of this very old crust and this means that we won't really start seeing large pieces of stable crust until about 3.8 billion years ago when the late heavy bombardment finishes. So during the Hadean and the Archean, the heat of accretion had had less time to dissipate and there were higher concentrations of radioactive isotopes in the Earth's mantle. So the heat of accretion is simply the energy that's imparted into the Earth every time it gets hit by something. So every time the Earth got hit by a meteorite or every time you know, a tiny, tiny, tiny little dust particle hit the Earth and became incorporated into it as the Earth grew, 
each one of those events would put in a tiny amount of energy into the earth obviously the bigger the event the more energy it would impart into the earth and some of this energy would be imparted in the form of heat energy and so when you bear in mind the earth must have formed through billions of little impacts well that means you're going to have had a lot of heat energy put into the earth by all of these impacts when you you know add them together and this is called the heat of accretion. So some of the heat inside the Earth, even now, is the result of this heat of accretion. All this thermal energy that, would, that was inputted into the Earth during its, stage, you know, during its formation stage. At the same time, in the Hadean and the Archean, the mantle had higher concentrations of radioactive isotopes. Obviously, over time, these radioactive isotopes have been decaying to stable daughter isotopes. So, you know... Over the past 4.5 billion years, there's been a steady decrease in the amount of radioactive isotopes in the mantle. So this would have meant the higher heat of accretion and the higher number of radioactive isotopes would have meant the mantle was very, very hot compared to the present day. So this would have meant a few things. Number one, it would have meant that volcanism was common because the mantle was so hot, it would have made it very easy to melt rocks inside the Earth's interior, so that would have produced very large quantities of magma, and that would have obviously worked its way to the surface and it would have been you know, released onto the surface via volcanoes. So we also need to bear in mind is that, the, what we also need to bear in mind is that there could have been little to no water during the Hadean as well. And water is very, very important when it comes to plate tectonics because water helps to lubricate the process. And so the lack of water during this time period would have meant that plate tectonics would have been difficult. And where we did have plate tectonics, it probably would have been quite erratic. So the Hadean would have been a period of lots and lots of volcanism and very, very chaotic plate tectonics. Now, this volcanism is actually helpful to us because it puts lots and lots of gases into the Earth's early atmosphere. So the Earth's atmosphere actually forms through the process of degassing, which is volcanoes releasing the gases from the Earth's interior onto the surface to form the atmosphere. And the atmosphere that would have formed via this degassing process would have been very rich in water vapor, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and a few other things. The one thing you'll notice, by the way, that's missing from this list is oxygen. And we're going to come on to that later on. So we're pretty certain that the Earth's surface had a stabilized, stabilized sufficiently by about 4 to 3.8 billion years ago to allow for a solid continuous crust. Now, it's difficult to say when the first crust formed. However, we know that some must have existed because we have these Jack Hill zircons, of which the oldest one is 4.4 billion years. And we tend to interpret these zircons as having come from felsic igneous rocks. And so that would mean, obviously, if they had come from something like a granite, well, obviously, the, the magma that formed the granite must have had to, would have had to have intruded a crust of some kind in order to cool down and form that granite. Or... If the uh, zircons were deposited as part of some kind of extrusive felsic rock, something like a rhyolite, well, once again, that would have meant you had to have had a volcano. That volcano had to have been sitting on a piece of stable crust. And so the presence of these zircons indicates to us that, yes, around 4.4 billion years ago, there must have been some kind of crust present. However, the problem is, is whether that crust was continuous and how you know strong and stable it really was is kind of debatable. So, you know, that's a little problematic. So when it comes down to actually finding rocks which we can say, right, you know, this represents a piece of stable crust. Well, the oldest one we have is actually called the Acasta Nice, and it dates to about 4.02 billion years. And it's the oldest piece of crust identified. And here's a piece of the Acasta Nice here. It consists mostly of gneisses. So you can see the banding very, very nicely there. It's a, it's a lovely example of a gneiss. And these gneisses are mostly of a granitic composition. So there's lots and lots of quartz, lots and lots of potassium feldspar, a little bit of sodium plagioclase feldspar, and a few other things mixed in there. So this is the kind of material that the continental crust is made from. So within this material, so within the acastonite, we also discovered a zircon inclusion, 
So the zircon inclusion in question was within a piece of rock that dated to 3.95 billion years, but the zircon inclusion actually dated to 4.2 billion years and so once again what we have here is a, a a piece of rock which probably came from a pre-existing rock now because this rock's been metamorphosed it's debatable whether this zircon represents the original protolith which was metamorphosed or whether this zircon represents some kind of clastic particle that just you know just so happened you know, that it wasn't metamorphosed as part of the process of taking the protolith and changing it into a gneiss. So we can't be 100% sure whether this zircon was actually part of the protolith or whether it was part of another rock and it was actually a clast. So we're not 100% sure, but we know once again that the presence of this zircon indicates that there was probably some kind of stable crust around 4.2 billion years ago. So the, the caster gneiss tells us, yes, we definitely had solid crust by about four billion years, but there's a good chance we, you know, we had a we had solid crust about 4.2 billion years. Now this happens to agree quite nicely with the Jack Hill zircons from Australia. The Jack Hill zircons tend to date from between about four to 4.2 billion years ago. So that would also help to make us think, right, you know, we have all of these zircons which are about 4, 4.2 billion years old. That's indicating that, you know, we have these, you know, these zircon bearing rocks forming and that would indicate to us that there was probably a stable crust. Now, we can be 100% certain we definitely have a stable crust about 3.8 billion years ago because that's when we have the issue of greenstone belt, which is on the west coast of Greenland. And this is actually a greenstone belt so if you look at this picture here here's a picture of the issue of greenstone belt and these gray green rocks are the greenstones and they're cut by these pink rocks which are granites so the one thing we can be sure is that these the issue of greenstone belt itself dates to 3.8 billion years ago and the issue of greenstone belt is part of uh, is a piece of oceanic crust so the fact that it is a piece of oceanic crust tells us that, number one, we had oceanic crust, which is a good indicator of plate tectonics. But the other thing is that this piece of oceanic crust has been preserved because it's been pushed onto continental crust. It's been obducted. So this process of obduction means you have oceanic crust that gets pushed onto continental crust. Well, obviously, if the issue of greenstone belt has been obducted, that clearly means there has to have been some stable continental crust for it to have been pushed onto. And so once again, the presence of this greenstone belt indicates that there must have been some kind of stable crust at latest 3.8 billion years ago. So it looks like, you know, we definitely had a crust probably from somewhere between 4 and 4.2 billion years ago, and we definitely had one 3.8 billion years ago. Before that, we can, you know, argue quite a lot about, you know, how continuous was that crust, how stable was that crust. So what would the Earth's early crust have actually been like? Well, the Earth's first crust must have crystallized directly from the magma ocean. So if we remember the Bowen's reaction series, the first minerals that will form will be olivine and pyroxene. Now, they're going to go and form the ultramafic mantle. So if I just skip to the next slide here, here's our magma ocean. Now, I need to point out this is for the moon, but the same process works for the Earth. So we have our magma ocean. Now, initially, our magma ocean is going to become saturated with iron-nickel alloy, and that iron-nickel alloy is going to settle under gravity to form the core of the Earth. Now then what happens is, is the silicate magma ocean is going to keep cooling down and eventually it's going to reach the point where it starts to crystallize out olivine, which are represented here as the green crystals. And then eventually it's going to crystallize out pyroxene, represented here as the blue crystals. And these crystals are going to you know, float around in the magma until they grow large enough that gravity is going to kick in and gravity is going to start pulling them down where they'll start to form a layer around the Earth's core. Now this is going to become the Earth's mantle. So olivine and pyroxene have a density of 3.3 and 3.2 grams per centimeter cube, respectively. And this means they will sink in the, through the silicate magma. So the silicate magma would have had a density of about 2.8 grams per centimeter cubed, so they're heavier. So they'll sink through it quite easily. Eventually, though, 
we thought we start crystallizing out olivine then we crystallize out pyroxene and then the next mineral to crystallize will be calcium plagioclase feldspar which is sometimes referred to as anorthite so anorthite has a density of 2.73 grams per centimeter cubed it's lighter than the magma and so this will mean that the uh, the calcium rich plagioclase feldspar instead of sinking will float and so we'll start to build up a scum of calcium plagioclase feldspar across the surface of the magma ocean and this is going to be our first crust so the early crust will have been anorthite rich and it probably will have been a type of mafic rock which is called an anorthosite so an anorthosite is a rock which is dominated by anorthite so it would have looked a lot like the moon's highlands so it would have looked very white to light gray in color so if we look back at the moon here these dark patches they represent basalt so we're going to ignore those what we're interested in are these lighter regions and they are called the highlands and they're made of anorthite and so the earth's first crust would probably have looked something like that now we need to remember that between the mantle and the early crust there will have been a body of magma which will have been constantly convecting and there will have been lots of mantle upwellings and downwellings because of this convection and this will have made the earth's early crust very unstable and it would have meant there would have been some plate tectonics but once again that plate tectonics would have been very limited it would have been very erratic so you know so during this time period we can't really say plate tectonics was operating now as you can see from this model eventually as we crystallize out solid minerals from the liquid magma the volume of magma keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually you're left with very small volumes of magma located right here now the thing is is calcium plagioclase feldspar olivine and pyroxene don't really use that many minerals so they contain iron magnesium calcium a little bit of silicon and some oxygen and that's pretty much it so that means there's a whole range of elements that aren't being used to make these minerals and so this means that as the magma volume gets smaller the concentration of these elements which are left behind gets higher and higher and higher and so by the time we're at this point, we have a magma that's very, very rich in things like silicon, aluminum, potassium, sodium, etc. And this magma is going to be stuck here between the crust and the mantle. And so this magma is obviously going to start intruding the crust. And if you think about the chemistry that we have here, well, what we have here is the kind of chemistry you would expect to find in felsic and intermediate igneous rocks. And so these this you know, late stage residual magma is going to intrude the early crust. So it's going to form rocks like granite and diorite. And some of it will make it to the surface where it will be erupted from volcanoes in the form of rocks like rhyolite and andesite. So we have these plutonic rocks, granites and diorites, and we have these extrusive rocks, rhyolites and andesites. And so what this is going to mean is these will be the first stages of the continental crust so these chunks of felsic igneous rocks will start moving around the surface of the earth and they will start banging into each other and coalescing to give us the early continental crust so the erosion of any volcanoes that formed on the surface will have formed features like island arcs so volcanic island arcs and of course the erosion of these volcanic rocks and any kind of pyroclastic material that they produce will of course lead to the formation of sediments those sediments will contain feldspar and quartz and they will have you know essentially been deposited into any kind of ocean basin or any kind of depression which formed and so this will also have helped in the formation of silica rich metamorphic rocks like gneisses or these rocks can be melted to produce very silica and feldspar rich magmas which will then obviously crystallize to give us rocks like granite diorite rhyolite or andesite and so you can see that we have the early stages of continental crust formation happening right there so as with the moon this early crust that forms would have rifted and this would have meant the mantle rocks underneath which remember would have been very very hot well if you remember when we break the crust 
it means the mantle rocks underneath are at lower pressure, but they're still at very, very high temperature, and so they will melt through decompressional melting. And so this means that there will have been lots and lots of mafic magmas being produced through mantle melting, and so this would have meant that there would have been huge quantities of flood basalts erupting onto the surface of the earth. So a modern example of a flood basalt environment is Iceland. Okay, so we would have we would not only have had these granite and diorite intrusions and volcanoes in the crust or on the crust, we would have also have had the crust splitting and huge quantities of basalt erupting onto the surface in the forms of flood basalts, and they would have covered the surface of the earth and they would have looked something like this. Now the interesting thing about basalt is basalt is naturally quite a dense rock. And so when you build up large piles of it, it's naturally going to weigh down the crust and it's going to cause the crust to warp downwards. And obviously when you start to make the crust warp downwards, you start forming depressions and depressions will naturally fill with water. And so we obviously have the first stages of ocean basins. This basalt therefore represents the first stages of oceanic crust formation as well. So eventually we end up with a layered earth that looks like this. So this is a diagram that you may have seen before. Now obviously depending on how we're splitting up the earth, you can split it up based on its composition or the, the mechanical features of the layers. But essentially we ended up with the continental crust, which is rich in sodium, potassium and calcium silicates and loads of quartz. We have the oceanic crust, which is rich in calcium iron silicates. We have the mantle which is rich in iron magnesium silicates and we have the core which is made up of iron nickel alloy okay so that's chemically speaking what these layers are made from if you think of them from a, from a physical standpoint we ended up with the lithosphere which is solid the asphenosphere which is liquid or semi-liquid should i say it's like a slushy we have the mesosphere which is solid the outer core liquid and the inner core solid so just make sure you remember this diagram because it does have a habit of turning up in exams. Okay, so this is a good place for us to stop part one. So get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water and please come back for part two.